Hello, everyone. How you doing? Are you guys tired? You're supposed to say no. Right? Okay, it's time to listen to the word. Please open to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Please open your Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter 9. Second Samuel chapter 9 from verse 1, I will read. Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is on the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring the fruits that thy, master's son, that thy master's son may have food to eat. And Mephibosheth thy master's son shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant too. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Okay, I read up to verse 11. <clears throat> uh, in 2006, uh, there was a world camp, global camp in Hawaii. Uh, so at the time, uh, we had about 15 college student, 1,500 college students uh, travel from Korea to attend the global camp in Hawaii. And so this was already about eight years ago, and at the time it was a big, big deal you know, to have 1,500 students traveling all the way from Korea to attend the global camp in Hawaii. And also, <clears throat> at the time, uh, uh, God helped us with a lot of things, getting the visa for the choir, uh, excuse me, getting the visa for the IYF students, and also getting the airplane flights. God helped us with many, many things, and it was a very, very beautiful camp. And at the time, uh, Pastor Park was invited to speak on a radio show. And this was a morning radio show. And at the time, um, Pastor Park was going to speak on the radio show. And because I interpret for Pastor Park, I got to go with him. And I still remember vividly, the appointment was supposed to be at 7 o'clock. But we left very early. We left around 6 o'clock and we arrived at the radio station around uh, 6.45. But on our way in the car to the radio station, uh, there was an elder who was driving the car, and I was sitting in the front. Pastor Park was sitting right behind me, and then another brother was sitting next to Pastor Park. And you know, it's an American radio station. So Pastor Park was telling me, okay, Joseph, we're going to be arriving at the radio station soon. You know, I hope you do a good job of interpreting for me. Oh, yes, Pastor, I'll try my best. And you know what, though? You know, it's an American radio station, and all the listeners are American. So if I speak a lot in Korean, then that's going to be a waste of time. So what I'll do is I'll keep my Korean short, 
And when you translate for me, you make it very long, okay? You make it very long. You add in the details. You fill in the blanks. You, you know, you add in all these different things here and there, and you make it really, really long, okay? Oh, I said, okay, pastor, let's do that. And pastor says, okay, let's practice. Okay. So pastor said, uh, everyone, right now we're having the IYF Global Camp at the Hawaii Convention Center. Translate. It's okay. Right now, we're having the IYF Global Camp at the Hawaii Convention Center. We have about 15 students, 1,500 students here from Korea. The Gracious Choir is performing here. Russian artists are performing here. Tomorrow, we're going to have a concert at the Waikiki Shell. And we're, we're having another program called the Homestay Program. And on this date, we're going to have the Christmas Cantata. Blah, 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 blah. So I made it very, very long. And Pastor said, oh, okay, good job. That's what we're going to do. All right, let's go. And so we arrived at the radio station. We arrived around uh, 6.45. And then we were just sitting and waiting. Uh, and then they called us in. They called us in when it became 7 o'clock. And we walked into the studio. It was a middle-aged man and then a, a lady, a, young, a lady with blonde hair, a, a pretty lady. She was, I think, maybe in her late 30s or early 40s. And so the two of them were the hosts. And so we walked in, and then <clears throat> the, uh, the radio show the interview started. And so the man, he asked Pastor Park, oh, Pastor Park, you're from Korea. Oh, yes, I'm from Korea. Pastor Park, as you know, Korea is divided into North and South Korea. North Korea is ruled by communism, in South Korea, you have democracy. So, Pastor Park, how are you active in fighting against the communist forces? And so this question, you know, is a very political question, right? It has nothing to do with IYF. It has nothing to do with, you know, Good News Corps or, or Good News Mission. And so I translated for Pastor Park. And then Pastor Park, he thought for a moment. And then he said, oh, in 1993, I went to the United States. And I met a young man named Andy. And his mother came to me and said, Oh, Pastor, my son is doing drugs. He carries a pistol. Oh, I don't know what to do with him. And so she asked me to care for him. So I brought him with me to Korea. And I taught him the Bible, the world of the heart, for six months. And through that, he completely changed. And kids in America, other students in America, heard about how he had changed. And so every summer, students from America began to come to Korea to attend our camps. And that camp grew and grew and grew. In 2001, it became the IYF. So that was his answer. And so <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the question, but pastor explained all that he wanted to about the IYF. Okay, so the host asked the next question. Uh, pastor, right now in America, in Korea, there is very heavy anti-American sentiment. You know, American soldiers, you know, they often get bullied and picked on in public. And so, you know, what, what are you doing to fight against such anti-American sentiment in Korea? And so once again, I translated for pastor. And pastor thought for a moment. And then pastor said, we have a program called the Good News Corps. In 2001, we dispatched 14 short-term missionaries all over the world. In 2002, we dispatched 58. In 2003, 111. And this year, we sent 500 short-term missionaries all over the world, taking one year off from college to do volunteer work in Africa, South America, and all over the world. And you know, if they do that kind of work all over the world, of course, you know, the anti-sentiment anti-American sentiment in Korea would die down, wouldn't you think? And so that was his answer. And so uh, after that, they didn't ask questions anymore about, you know, those political things. And so from then on, for about 40 minutes, pastor was able to talk freely about the IYF, the Good News Corps, the Gracious Choir, the Global Camp, and also about the Gospel and talked freely about uh, freely for about 40 minutes. Later on, we found out 
that the two hosts, well, the, the lady, she was a uh, radio show host, and the man, he was a state senator. And so this was a political radio show. Now, we had gone to the radio show without even knowing that it was a political radio show. And they were asking us all these political questions. Anyhow, <clears throat> uh, after those first two questions, uh, you know, we were able to talk freely about the IYF. And then at about 7.45, the interview ended. And so when the interview ended, you know, we shook hands, you know, we took pictures together, and then the lady host, she kissed Pastor Park on the cheek. Right? And so as we were leaving, you know, Pastor Park asked me, hey, Joseph, what am I supposed to do when an American lady kisses you on the cheek? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> and then um, we went in the car and we left. But as I was leaving, I thought a lot about this inside of my heart, about the interview that we just had. Because this lady, the radio show host, and also the state senator, you know, compared to them, I'm absolutely nothing. Even if I'm not compared to them, I'm absolutely nothing. But even when I'm compared to them, even more so, I'm absolutely nothing. They're so much smarter than me, so much more eloquent than me, you know, so much stronger than me in every way, you know, so much bigger, better, stronger, everything in every way. Yet, when I was in there, in that studio, speaking with the host, speaking with the state senator, I was translating, but at the same time, I was able to freely speak all that was inside of my heart. I was able to freely, boldly speak in front of, in front of the radio audience, in front of the state senator, in front of the DJ, and in front of the host, in front of the producers, in front of the, all the people in Hawaii that are listening. I was able to speak very freely without even a little bit of shame or timidness or difficulty in my heart, speak very freely about everything inside of my heart, all that I was proud of, the gospel, the salvation, the IYF. And I thought about that. You know, it's not like it's a fight, you know, me against them. It's not like a confrontational fight or anything. But if it was any other circumstance in front of such people, I wouldn't be able to speak a word. I wouldn't be able to say a thing. I wouldn't be able to even try to express my heart. But because I was in there, not just as myself, but I was in there with the servant of God. I was in there not to represent myself, but to represent IYF. I was in there not in my own name, but in the name of the gospel. I found that I was able to speak all that was inside of my heart. And even though these were much bigger, stronger, more powerful people than me, they could not intimidate me or make me feel small or less, not even a little tiny bit. And as I thought about that, I felt very, very thankful in my heart. Wow, God, compared to these people, I'm really, really nothing. But wow, I'm, I was able to speak all that was in my heart in front of such people, on a radio station, in front of all these people. God, I'm so thankful in my heart. And immediately after the radio station uh, was done, we went to uh, the governor's office, the Hawaii governor, and Governor Linda Lingle, I still remember her name. So we went to the governor's office. Pastor Park has had a visit with her. And so we had Pastor Park and also an elder who was a stone artist. You know, the three of us went together. And then uh, it was a very brief meeting. The governor came out, shook our hands, and said hello. And then the elder presented a gift that he had prepared for the, uh, the governor. It was a painting of a pigeon. And he gave it to the, the, um, the governor. Oh, governor said, thank you. And the elder all of a sudden, oh, governor, I wanted to commit suicide. And so I immediately I translated. Everyone's looking to me to translate. Because the governor is kind of stunned. You know, I meet this guy for the first time, and he's telling me he wanted to commit suicide, right? And then the elder went on to explain, you know, my life was filled with nothing but darkness and despair. But I met the gospel, I met Pastor Park, and my heart was completely changed. Governor, the, in the Korean culture, pigeon uh, is an animal that brings good news. I've also met the good news in my heart. And I hope that, Governor, good news will not cease in your life as well. And then Pastor Park preached the gospel about five minutes to the uh, governor of Hawaii. 
you know, she listened very well, so thank you. And of course, you know, because I'm the translator, I was in there you know, translating the conversation, translating the gospel preaching and all that. And as I did all that, I was very, very once again thankful in my heart. Who am I to be a part of preaching the gospel to the governor? Who am I to be introducing the gospel, the good news mission, the IYF, you know, on the radio in Hawaii? Who am I to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the state senator, you know, with the radio DJ? Who am I to be doing all of those things? I'm absolutely nobody. I felt very, very thankful in my heart. But, the, but what God clearly showed me was, I was not there representing myself. I was not there representing my own name, my own life, or my own heart. I was there representing the IYF. I was there representing the things that God had given me. I was there with the servant of God, and I was there with the gospel. And when I was in there with the gospel, with the servant of God, I could feel God really exalting me, God really protecting me, and also God being with me that no one is able to touch me. And when I thought about that, I was very, very thankful to God. Everyone, today I read the words about Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9. In the Bible, there is a person named Mephibosheth. His father was Jonathan, and his grandfather was Saul. Now, Saul was the first king of Israel. When Saul was the first king of Israel, Saul's biggest enemy was David. Because Saul was afraid that David would become king. And so Saul always felt intimidated by David. Saul always felt threatened by David. And Saul always felt that he had to kill David. And so, but one day, against the war, in the war against the Philistines, Saul and his son Jonathan die in the war. And naturally, David becomes the king of Israel, and Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, goes into hiding. And so those four characters are who I'm going to talk about today, okay? So pay close attention. It's Saul, and Saul's son, Jonathan, and Jonathan's son is? Is what? Louder. Louder. Mephibosheth, okay? Mephibosheth. Okay, once again, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. That's right. So it's Saul, Jonathan, and Mephibosheth. Now, David is not from their family. Saul and Jonathan died in the war, and David became king. Now, <clears throat> when David becomes king, Mephibosheth is a little child, and Mephibosheth's nurse, she takes Mephibosheth and runs away. And while running away, she falls over. And because of that, Mephibosheth's legs become crippled. He become lame on both of his feet. And then they go into hiding. Now, while they are living in hiding, the nurse, right, naturally would tell Mephibosheth about his background. Hey, Mephibosheth, do you know who your father is? Your father is a man named Jonathan. Hey, Mephibosheth, do you know who your grandpa is? Your grandpa is a man named Saul. He was the first king of Israel. And you know what? If it weren't for David, you too would be living your life in the palace. If it weren't for David, you would have never become crippled on both of your legs. You know what, Mephibosheth? If it weren't for David, you would have become the prince of Israel, and you would have become the king of Israel. But because of David, Mephibosheth, you have to live in hiding. That's why we have to be poor. And that's why we can't even go out freely. Because if David finds us, if David knows where we are, surely he will come and kill us. So from a young age, the nurse, Mephibosheth nurse, continually talked and talked and talked and talked about David to Mephibosheth. And as Mephibosheth listens to these things, an image of David is formed in Mephibosheth's mind. Oh, that's right. 
It's because of David my life is a mess. If it weren't for David, my life would be as good as anybody else. But because of David, I have no freedom. Because of David, I live in all this pain and darkness and fear. This is all David's fault. And my legs are crippled all because of David. His heart is filled with rage and hatred and bitterness. And the worst part is, there's nothing he can do about it. He has no power to do anything about it. Everyone, have you ever hated someone? Have you ever hated someone? Yes, right? We've all hated someone, right? You know, I'm a pastor, right? I'm a pastor, and for the most part, I try not to curse, right? But when I'm driving... When I'm driving, I curse a lot, right? And so, so when I'm driving, you know, someone cuts me off. You know, all kinds of curse words, you know, come out of my mouth, right? Sometimes in Korean, you know, sometimes in English, right? It all comes out, you know, right? And so even for small things, you feel hatred in your heart. You feel upset or you feel angry. Or if you have a specific hatred for so-and-so, for one specific person, oh, I hate that person. But the strange thing about hatred is, when you hate someone, who's the one that suffers? You, right? Strange thing about hatred is, when you hate someone, it's you that suffers. If I hate somebody, I would wish that he would suffer and he would be in pain. He would feel my hatred and, and be miserable. But the strange thing about hatred is, the more you hate someone, the more miserable you become, right? Right? So hating is very, very painful when you hate someone. It's very, very painful. It's, it's very smart to uh, just let it go early on, right? The more you hate, the more you suffer. Anyhow, just imagine Mephibosheth's heart. He was filled with all kind of hatred towards David. And he's the king. I can't even do anything about it. My legs are crippled. What's he going to do? He's going to try to go and fight and kill David? He can't even do that. And so he has all this hatred and bitterness bottled up inside of his heart. But there was nothing he can do about it. And time passed and Mephibosheth grew and grew, grew into an adult holding this kind of bitterness and grief inside of his heart. Now, in chapter 9, verse 1, we see David calling for Mephibosheth. Let's read here. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David is looking from any family members alive from the house of Saul to what? To kill them? To have vengeance upon them? What does it say? That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. In David's heart, he had a plan to show kindness to remaining members of Saul's family. Now, why did David have this kind of a heart? Like I said, it was Saul, Jonathan, and Mephibosheth. Saul hated David, and Saul wanted to kill David, but Jonathan was really, really good friends with David. And Jonathan and David make a promise. Okay? Let's look at that in the Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 20. First Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. First Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. <clears throat> and thou shalt not only while yet I live show me kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off the kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from thee, face of the earth. Okay, everyone, let's read chapter 20, verse 15 out loud together, okay? If you don't have your Bibles, uh, it's on the screen, okay? Chapter 20, verse 15 together. One, two, three. But also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. So this was the promise made between David and Jonathan. Hey, David, I know you're going to become king, but when you become king, 
You have to promise me, okay, that you will not cut off kindness from my family, from my house. And David makes that promise. Okay, Jonathan, I'll make that promise, and I'll make sure I will keep that promise. So 2 Samuel chapter 9, the text that we read today, is David now stepping up to fulfill this promise that he had made with Jonathan. So David asks, Does anyone remain from the house of Saul that I may show kindness unto him for the sake of Jonathan? And then the servants do research. They go, oh, yes, yes, king, there is one man. Oh, who is it? Oh, there's a man named Mephibosheth. He is Jonathan's son. Oh, where does he live? Oh, he lives lives in a town called Lodabar. Bring him to me. So David's servants go, and they bring Mephibosheth to David. Now, think about Mephibosheth's mind, everyone. (gasps) David finally knows where I am. (gasps) David's now finally gonna kill me. Oh no, my life is over. Oh no, what should I do? Oh, there is no escape. Should I just curse at him before I die? What should I do? Oh, my life is so miserable. Oh, what a cursed life this is. All kinds of thoughts cross through Mephibosheth's heart. And then Mephibosheth finally arrives in front of David. And what does David say to him? Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth showed up, with an image of David in his own mind, an image of David in his own imagination, the evil David that destroyed my family, the evil David that ruined my life, the evil David that caused me to become crippled, the evil David that kept me from becoming a prince, that kept me from becoming a king. That image of David was what Mephibosheth had in mind when he was brought over to stand before David. But he comes and he meets the actual David. Not the David that had been created in his mind through all the years of the nurse raising him, telling him, you know, that David is evil. If it weren't for him, you would have been king. Your life is ruined because of David. Not that David that was created in his mind through the nurse over many, many years. But now Mephibosheth finally comes and meets the real David. The real David. And what is the real David? It says, Mephibosheth, fear not. Fear not. For I will surely show you kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. And I will restore unto you all the land of your grandfather Saul. And you know what? You will eat at my table continually, always, from now on. Everyone, the David that Mephibosheth had in his mind versus the actual David, were they the same or different? Yes, they were completely different. The David that Mephibosheth had in his mind was an evil David, a wicked David, a David who ruined his life. But the actual David had nothing but kindness for Mephibosheth. The actual David had nothing but plans of grace for Mephibosheth. The real David had nothing but grace and mercy for Mephibosheth. There are two Davids. One created in Mephibosheth's mind and the other that was in the heart of... The one that was created in the heart of Mephibosheth and the other one who is the actual real David. But so thankfully, here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, Mephibosheth comes to David and meets the real David. And everyone, that's what God wants to do inside of our hearts as well. Everyone, there is Mephibosheth's heart when he is living under the nurse. And there is Mephibosheth's life when he is living under David. When Mephibosheth is living under the nurse, he's always living in fear and darkness. But when he is living under David, he gets to have all the land restored to him. 
He gets to have all the, <clears throat> he gets to eat at the king's table continually. And he gets to receive all the kindness of King David. Everyone, this is not just a story about Mephibosheth. God has recorded this story not to talk to us about Mephibosheth, but this story is also about us. Our hearts could also remain in one of two places. Just as Mephibosheth's heart could remain under the influence of the nurse or remain under the influence of the kindness of David, our hearts as well could either remain under the influence of our own thoughts or remain under the influence of the heart of God. Earlier, I talked to you about uh, my experience at the Hawaii Global Camp. And as I thought about that in my heart, I was very, very thankful. Because if I was just a person who remained within my own influence, who was just living my life according to my own plans, my own desires, and my own ways, then I would never be able to do anything that I experienced at the Hawaii Global Camp. And not just the Hawaii Global Camp, throughout my life, I see God has done many, many things to lead me and to use me and to give me the many precious things that he has prepared for me. You know, today I'm able to speak in front of you, and I'm very, very thankful. You know, there's about 900 seats here, you know, all the seats are full. We have college students, middle school students, you know, high school students, right? You know, during the <clears throat> scavenger hunt, uh, one mistake I made was during the Pop-Tart segment of the scavenger hunt, I portioned the food the same amount for the college students and high school students and the middle school students. The portion of the pop tarts, you know, all the same, and I thought, yeah, you know, it'll be fine. But I, you know, but a lot of the middle school students I saw, you know, were struggling with the with the pop tarts. You know, one student I saw, he made like a pop tart burger, like like six six stack of pop tarts, and uh, he, <laughs> eating it like a burger. <clears throat> uh, I know it was very uh, painful for you, but but um, I was able to see that through it, you guys are growing closer together, right? Is that true? Okay, then we'll sure to do it again next year, okay? So you can grow even closer. Anyhow, <clears throat> I'm able to speak in front of you tonight. I'm so thankful to God. I'm able to do the scavenger hunt with you. I'm so thankful to God. I'm able to interpret for Pastor Oaks of Park. I'm so thankful to God. Then as I interpret for Pastor Oaks of Park, I become a part of preaching the gospel to many presidents all over the world. I'm so thankful to God. During the Karashas Choir Christmas Cantata Tour, I also get to preach the gospel in front of many, many people. I am so thankful to God. I'm not just thankful to God that I get to do these things. What I'm so thankful to God is, ah, there was me in God's heart. Not me under my own influence, but there was me in God's heart. Me under my own influence is nothing but misery and difficulty and pain and shame. But me in God's heart is a servant of the gospel. Me in God's heart is his tool to be used. Me in God's heart is his son whom God has many, many plans for. You know, uh, IYF started in 2001. And when the IYF started in 2001, Pastor Park in Korea, he said, IYF will become the best campus club in Korea. And he said that many, many times. And when I heard that, I couldn't really believe it because our actual circumstances were very, very different. Because when we would make IYF flyers and hand them out on college campuses, people would not take them at all, right? And then we would make posters, you know, IYF Bible Seminar, and we'd put them all over college campuses, and people would just rip them down. And we'd make big banners and put them on, you know, we're having Bible, IYF Bible Club, and put, put, put up the banners, and people would tear down the banners. It was very, very heartbreaking because, you know, as I witnessed on college campus, it's not like we had a lot of money, we were able to make those banners, make those posters, make those flyers. 
we, we, a few students get together, you know, pool our money and, and do those things, yet other students come and tear it down. It was very, very difficult. Uh, in Korea, I witnessed at a school called Jung, Jungang University. And in the school, uh, there were two, two born-again students at that school. And then, and then so myself, and then two married sisters from our church, and then the two students, the five of us, would witness at that school. And we said, okay, let's, uh, let's pull our money together and our energies together, and let's have a Bible seminar. Okay, let's have a Bible seminar. And we borrowed an auditorium. It was an auditorium uh, that sat 200 people. It was on an incline. Like, oh, this is a nice auditorium. And let's witness. And we witnessed with all our hearts for two weeks. And it became the first day of the Bible seminar at Chungang University. And so I was the main speaker, so I put on my suit, you know. I came all excited, you know, the, uh, and then... <clears throat> And then the sisters, you know, they prepared a flower for me. They put a flower on my suit. You know, and then the students and the sisters, they were all nicely dressed, you know, waiting for the new students to come. And then it was time for the Bible seminar to start. Two new students came. Two new students. Do you think I was happy or disappointed? Happy. I was so happy. Yes, two students came. You know, when you think zero is going to come and two students come, you feel really, really happy, right? When you think a hundred's gonna come and two show up, you know, you get very disappointed. But when you think zero's gonna come and two students come, you get really, really thankful. Oh, yes, two students came. I was really thankful. And so, you know, <clears throat> there were, so, um, so it's the five of us, and then two new students came. And then we're sitting there, and then uh, during the, during the uh, uh, promotional video, IY promotional video, one of the new students got up and left. It was very disappointing. Very disappointing, but still one student remaining. Right? Still one student remaining. And then we had one of the students, you know, one of the born-again students, come and talk about his Good News Core experience. And while she was giving her Good News Core experience, the other new student got up and left. Right then, you know, darkness started to settle in. What's going on here? Where all the new students are leaving. And then so it was just us, you know, the five of us who were witnessing together. It was just us. No new students at all. And then the student, and then finally it became time for the sermon. So the student who was emceeing, he said, ah, you know, my heart's been in a lot of difficulty these days, and I see that today, you know, nobody came to this Bible seminar. So, you know, that makes my heart in even more difficulty. Now Pastor Joseph Park will preach the word. That's how he introduced me. Everyone, is that how you're supposed to MC when you MC a Bible seminar? No, right? No, you, you can't talk, talk like that. You, know, you have to have faith even, even if the circumstances are bad, right? And so he introduced me. So I stood at the podium, and I was thinking to myself. I looked at, you know, the four of them sitting there, and they're all looking at the ground. They wouldn't look at me in the face. They're all looking at the ground. I could feel in the air... You know, the disappointment in the air. Nobody said, oh, I'm so disappointed. Why are we having a Bible seminar? No, nobody said that out loud. But I could feel the disappointment in the air. They're all looking at the ground. But I thought, I can't disappoint. You know, if I become despair too, then what are we going to do? Have like a, you know, you know, crying fest or whatever together? You know, we can't have that, right? I can't let down. I got to stay strong. You know, so I went forward with uh, what I had prepared. I still remember I prepared to preach about Cain and Abel. Uh, let's open the Genesis chapter 4. Everyone, do you know why God didn't accept Cain's offering? Blah, 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 blah. Do you know why God accepted Abel's offering? Blah, blah, blah. I try to stay strong. I try to, you know, stay positive. But they're all looking at the ground. But while I was preaching, I hear these sounds behind me. You know, and behind me, there was a big banner. Bible seminar with Pastor Joseph Park. It's a big banner posted behind me. But I look back, the banner was starting to fall off. And I look back, about half of it had fallen off, right? So all you could see, you know, was uh, Joseph Park, right? The Bible seminar part was falling down. Oh, the, even the banner's falling down. 
what's happening here? You know, why is God doing this to me? But still, stay positive. Keep going. Keep going. Still trying to preach. Still trying to stay positive. But as it's tearing down little by little behind me, our two students are cracking up. They're cracking up. You know, I wanted to you know, get down and punch them, right? <laughs> but I couldn't do that, right? The two students are cracking up. And the, but even though they're cracking up, they're kind of trying to hide it, you know? They're trying to hold their laughter. And then the whole banner just all fell to the ground, right? And then the rest of the... <laughs> They just, you know, burst out into big old laughter. And so, you know, I just preached a little more. I finished the sermon. And then after it was over, I called the two students over. No, there was no new people, no one to have fellowship with. So I called the two students over. And I said to them, why'd you laugh? Is this funny? Why'd you laugh? And that was our fellowship after the, after the service. But I've been to many, many Bible conferences like that on college campuses. I felt so small. <sighs> Nothing is working out. But God has made our, a lot of time has passed since then, but God has really blessed the IYF. Right now, IYF is the best college campus club in the whole world. We send hundreds of volunteers out abroad every year. And if you go to Africa, South America, Haiti, or Southeast Asia, You'll be amazed at the work the Good News Corps students do. Back then, we were so small and so shabby, but in the heart of God, indeed, IYF was the best club campus in the whole world. And we see it ringing true today so clearly. And not only that, I look at myself. Ah, 10, 11, 12 years ago, when I would have Bible seminars, I would preach. One person would come, zero person would come, two person would come, and that was the norm. But today, I'm able to preach in front of all of you. Ah, oh, this was me inside of God's heart. Everyone, I'm not here to talk about my experience with how I, about me, what I am today, or what Mephibosheth is when he met David. But I want to tell you, that this story of 2 Samuel chapter 9 and also my testimony of how God has led me to today is not about a story about me or a story of Mephibosheth, but it is of you. How you think of yourself, what you have in your mind of yourself versus what God in his heart has in mind for you. Who you are in the heart of God. The work that God hasn't planned for you in his heart. The things that God wants to accomplish through you in his heart. The work that God wants to do through you in God's heart. That's what I hope that you will come to discover through this IYF World Camp. Why? Because as long as we are thinking for ourselves, as long as we are under the influence of what I'm thinking for myself, all the conclusion we ever arrive at is like that of Mephibosheth under the nurse. Ah, oh, David's going to curse me. David's my enemy. My life is so miserable. This is so terrible. Everything sucks. My life would have been so much better without David. Nothing but despair and darkness. But everyone, once Mephibosheth met the actual David, the actual David had nothing but kindness for Mephibosheth. The actual David had nothing but mercy for Mephibosheth. The actual David wanted to make Mephibosheth eat at his table continually and wanted to restore unto him all the land of his father. Everyone, so are the plans that God has in store for you in God's heart. But just as Mephibosheth grew up under the nurse for a very, very long time, we too grew up for a very, very long time, not under some nurse, but someone very similar to that nurse, our own thoughts. And what do our own thoughts continually give you? Despair, darkness, fear, guilt, condemnation. Ah, I committed many sins. Yeah, my life is a mess anyways. I'll just throw myself to sin. Oh, yeah, this ain't going to work anyways. Might as well just, you know, mess, mess it up even more. 
Oh, why even try? You know, I failed at this, I failed at that. Well, I'm probably going to fail this anyways. Oh, why even try to listen to the word? I listened many times. It didn't help me any much anyways. In that way, just as David, just as Mephibosheth grew up under the darkness, under the influence of the nurse, we too for a long time had our hearts grow, having such hearts of darkness and despair and bitterness as long as we were under the influence of our own thoughts. But everyone, what I'm very thankful about today is in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David works to reverse all of that. David works to change all of that. David works to pull Mephibosheth out from the nurse's domain and put him into David's domain, where there is nothing but kindness. And everyone, this is what God is doing to you today. Through this world camp, through this mind lecture, through the programs that we have here, through God bringing you all the way over here from Alaska, Hawaii, Florida, from all over the United States, to pull you out from the darkness and into the domain of David. God wants to show you the real David. Not the David in Mephibosheth's thoughts, but the real David. God wants to show you the real God, the one who has nothing but kindness and peace and mercy in his heart for you. You know, the real God is found in the Bible, in the Word of God. We cannot meet God. We cannot find God in our own thoughts, right? You know, today, we had the scavenger hunt. You know, some students, uh, they come to the wrong place with the wrong clues. Right? Is this the easternmost end of the Mahanaim campus? Is that the westernmost end of the Mahanaim campus? Is this the northernmost end of the Mahanaim campus? Right? They come to wrong. If you come to the wrong place, you will not find right, the right station. Everyone, where do we find God? We find the heart of God where? Inside of this Bible. And in the Bible... The heart that David has for Mephibosheth is exactly the same heart God has for us. I'm going to say that one more time. The heart that David has towards Mephibosheth is the exact same heart that God has towards us. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Here, David expresses his heart in detail towards Mephibosheth. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to restore all of your land to you, and you will eat at my table continually. This heart towards Mephibosheth, everyone, it's not just David's expression of his heart to Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9. It is God's expression of his heart towards us sitting here today. God, what heart do you have towards me today? Oh, Esther, let me tell you. You know what heart I have towards you today, Esther? Esther, I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake and will restore you all the land of Saul thy father and you will eat bread at my table continually. Oh, God, what heart do you have towards me? Oh, Jennifer, let me tell you what heart I have towards you. I will show you kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore you all the land of your father, and, will show, and you will eat bread at my table continually. Everyone, this heart Mephibosheth has towards, David has towards Mephibosheth is the exact, identical, same heart that God has towards us. That's what the Bible is telling us today. If that's the case... We don't need to be in darkness anymore. We don't need to be in despair anymore. We don't need to be in fear anymore. Now we can have hope. Now we can have strength. Now we can have peace. Now we can have faith towards what God will accomplish through us in the future. Why? Because God's heart towards us is to give us kindness, to restore the land, and to have us eat at his table continually. And with that in mind, everyone, please open to Isaiah chapter 53. 
Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now everyone, once Mephibosheth meets the real David, his life of darkness is over. His life of fear is over. His life of guilt and condemnation, his life of hatred and bitterness, all that ends the moment Mephibosheth discovers the real David. And this is exactly the same with our hearts. When does the darkness in our hearts end? When does the bitterness and when do the fear and the guilt and condemnation, when does all that end? When we meet the real David, when we meet the real heart of God. And that is what Isaiah chapter 53 is giving us today. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Everyone here it tells us God has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Jesus at the cross took our sins away. But not only did Jesus take our sins away, he also took our griefs and he also took our sorrows. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Everyone, Jesus at the cross died and took all our sins away. No doubt about it. Made us righteous, made us clean once and for all. But here the Bible tells us Jesus also has taken, has borne all our griefs and carried all our sorrows. Ah, my sins are gone. Ah, my griefs are gone. Ah, my sorrows are gone. Why? Because Jesus has taken them all away. Everyone, the moment Mephibosheth meets the real David, the darkness ends, the hatred ends, the bitterness ends, the grief ends, the sorrow ends, the tears end. When? When Mephibosheth meets the real heart of David. And God is telling us his heart towards us today. Hey, you think you have griefs? I've taken all of your grief away. You think you have sorrows? No, you don't have any sorrows. I've taken all of your sorrows away. That's what Jesus has taken away at the cross. As clear as he has taken our sins away at the cross, so has he taken away our griefs. So has he taken away our sorrows. Everyone, that is what Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5 is telling us. But you might be thinking to yourself, but I still have griefs. But I still have sorrows. Everyone, what does the Bible say? The Bible says Jesus has taken all of your griefs away, all of your sorrows away. In our church, we have a sister who's had cancer for two years. And sometimes she becomes very, very sick. What about her? She has cancer. Jesus took our griefs away. Jesus took our sorrows away. Why does she have cancer? Everyone. Jesus has taken our griefs away. Jesus has taken our sorrows away. Then whatever difficulty you may have, or whatever disease you may have right now, are not difficulties, are not diseases, but they were given to you from God so that God may bestow grace unto you, so that God may work upon you, so that God may pour his mercy upon you. That is why they have been allowed by God in our lives. Not, not for them to remain as grief to cause us pain until we die. Not for them to remain as sorrows to cause us misery until we die. But they have been allowed unto us by God so that God may work upon us. So that God may draw us closer to Him. So that God may bestow His grace upon us. So that God may give us His mercy. Such things have been allowed into our lives. If so, the difficulties, the disease, the hardships in our lives, even they are good things. Even they are good things. Why? Because they were not given to destroy us, to condemn us, to put us to pain and guilt, but for God to bestow grace unto us, for God to link us closer 
to God. Everyone, just as Mephibosheth came to discover the true heart of David, God is drawing you to discover God's true heart. And when I think about that, I'm very, very thankful to God. And once again, I want to tell you, throw away the God inside of your real imagination. Inside of your imagination. You know, when Mephibosheth meets David, he has to throw away his old idea of David. Oh, I used to think David was so wicked and sinister and evil and tried to kill me. Ah, but that's not the real David. The real David wants to bestow grace unto me, have kindness upon me. Likewise, you must throw away your own idea of God inside of your heart. Oh, God condemns me. God wants me to be miserable. God punishes me. Ah, no. God wants to bestow kindness unto me. Ah, God has taken my griefs and my sorrows away. Ah, God wants to give me peace, and God wants to give me hope, and God wants to give me faith. Ah, that's who the real God is. Not only should you throw away your own imagination, the, the God inside of your own imagination, there's also one more thing you have to throw away. Your own image as reflected in your own thoughts. Oh, me? I'm nothing. Oh, me? Yeah, I've messed up till now, so I'll just continue to be a mess. Oh, me, yeah, my life has been, you know, hopeless till now, so it'll continue to be hopeless. Yeah, you know, I failed at this and that, so of course I'll fail at that. Whatever idea you have of yourself, then that also must be thrown away. And what does God want to establish inside of you? God wants to establish inside of you, you inside of God's heart. Ah, uh, who am I in God's heart? Who am I in God's heart? Mephibosheth under nurse's domain, he was always in pain and suffering. But Mephibosheth under David's domain, he lives boldly. He lives freely. He lives enjoying all the good things of King David. Ah, uh, then who am I? In my own thoughts, I'm just a petty nobody. Uh, but in God's heart, God wants to exalt me. God wants to work through me. God wants to preach the gospel through me. God wants to serve other people through me. God wants to use me to relay hope and faith and peace to many other people through me. In that way, everyone, I hope that you will discover who you are inside of God's heart. And when I think about that, I'm very, very thankful because our griefs and our sorrows at times, these things overwhelm us. At times, we think these things are going to destroy us. But everyone, God has taken them away. And all that remains from Mephibosheth is peace and joy and hope. And all that remains for us as well is peace and joy and thankfulness and grace. That's why in verse 5, Isaiah 53 verse 5 says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our, our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Here it says, our wounds, our bruises, were all <clears throat> our transgressions, our iniquities were all paid for, and now we have peace through his chastisement, and through his stripes we are healed. So what remains for us now is no longer grief and pain and sorrow, but what now remains for us is joy and peace and healing. The darkness and bitterness is no more for Mephibosheth. What remains for him now is thankfulness, eating at the king's table, freedom, and joy. And when I hope that you will discover this inside of the heart of God. I hope that you will discover the true heart of God. And also I hope that you will discover yourself in the heart of God. And just as Mephibosheth enjoyed all of those beautiful things inside of David, I hope that you too will enjoy the grace and thankfulness and joy and peace inside of God. Thank you. I will end my sermon here. Let us pray. Let us pray. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we are just like Mephibosheth. Lord, our hearts were filled with nothing but darkness and grief. But Lord, you have shown Mephibosheth David's true heart. In that same way, Lord, you are showing us your true heart through the IYF World Camp. 
how much kindness and mercy you have in store for us, and we really thank you for that. May you open the hearts of our students here so that they will throw away their own idea of God and gain the true God in their hearts. And also, they will also throw away their own idea of themselves and gain the, the idea of themselves within the heart of God, which is the true image of who we are. Lord, we thank you for keeping us safe and leading us through this first day of the world camp. And we hope that you will continue to bestow grace unto us through the world camp and bless the hearts of all the students here. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.